G'day, uh, my name is Grant Leeworth and this is a presentation I gave to the Australian National University's um, McKesson Conference, which was held a number of years ago uh, with uh, Professor Marshall Clark and Campbell McKnight, the legendary anthropologist in attendance. Um, at the time I was working for Tasmanian Seafoods and um, this trip was undertaken uh, with the support of the Australian Seafood CRC and Deakin University. And I acknowledge the Anandiliakwa Land Council and the Aminjirinja Aboriginal Corporation as well for their support uh, in this project. So the Northern Territory Japan fishery or sea cucumber fishery started um, about 100 years ago um, in the 1800s. Um, and the turn of the century really was the time um, that it really kicked off. So um, in the 80s, the modern uh, era, uh, we had uh, the stories of John Chatterton um, being up there with the Japanese longliner. And I'm not gonna dwell so much on the history in this presentation, but show you pictures from our 2009 genetic survey of the sandfish, so hopefully you'll get some insight into the operation of the Japan industry in the NT today. Now obviously um, when it first started it was, it was high volume, low value and they didn't really understand uh, the processing methods and there was a really good uh, survey by Loyal Vale and um, then Tasmanian seafoods entered the fishery. Um, when I was undertaking this uh, genetic study to support the um, ranching project, the, there was a lot of turmoil in the uh, fishery at the time. Um, uh, not, not so much the fishery, but in the company at the time, there was a, uh, a barge that had been purchased uh, from one of the uh, managers in, in the Northern Territory and um, it wasn't really what it was cracked up to be and so it was sent over to Kupan uh, to get fixed and there was this big furor about uh, the charges and associated things and so I've turned up uh, to um, do this genetic study in the Northern Territory while all this stuff was going on in the background and um, it was certainly an interesting time. And uh, we made the arrangements uh, with the company owner, to, uh, Alan Hansen, and got his approval uh, directly and ignored all the rubbish that was going on. And um, we made the call with my crew that we needed to commandeer the vessel, which was, was quite adventurous. Uh, we, we, we knew we had to do the... Um, uh, the study, uh, Will Bowman and I had been to Canada and seen the results of the uh, massive um, NOAA uh, salmon genetic study. And we knew that like, if we were going to be uh, genetically manipulating the stock, then um, we needed to be able to quantify that and show that we weren't uh, creating endemism. Um, and so the actual um, study was really worthwhile. That's the Grace One there. Um, that was the vessel we were going to take. So we arrived in Darwin and the whole company was in uproar about this couponing issue and the Darwin manager turned up and called me a glittering idiot and I responded well I'm not the one that has a barge stuck in coupang and he had a mind melt at the time <laughs> and um, so I was very much focused on what needed to happen because like if this genetic study had, didn't uh, go ahead, we wouldn't have the baseline genetic data to allow the um, stock enhancement uh, project from going ahead. Uh, it just wouldn't have worked, you know. Uh, we'd always be uh, coming up against this question. Uh, environmental groups would be saying, well, what are you doing, you know? Um, and you know, I think it was a really good baseline. It was well conceived at the time, and with the support of the Australian Seafood CRC, it was just fantastic. So I hadn't 
finished my Master 5 at this stage, and so I got my friend Andrew Morrison, who's in the green T-shirt, to come along because he was fully qualified. And, um, yeah, we, we were just a crack team of hardcore professionals. Uh, Tommy Bluthwaite, absolute legend. So getting the vessel finished and out of the duck pond was a massive task in itself. We were working to 5am every, every morning and um, we, we, when we actually took off, trying not to hit millionaires' yachts, um, and all, I mean, the other commercial fishing vessels weren't so much the issue, it was all the uh, fancy boats in the duck pond. But we got out there and there was just some beautiful weather that we were able to um, uh, get out there and uh, yeah, feel a bit more confident. <clears throat> so after studying this area for years, to finally get up to Popham Bay and Cape Don, um, it, it was amazing, you know, because I'd, I'd found uh, Campbell McKnight's book in the bottom of a library, a university library, and literally dusted it off, like, and... Um, Nobody had borrowed it since it had been published, and now everybody's very much interested in this amazing study that he's done. And, um, you know, to, to be actually going around, uh, you know, where the original Trapang fishery was uh, in the, you know, uh, 18, uh, probably the 1870s, uh, 1890s. Um, it was really interesting, you know. Um, so this is me uh, set up to dive, probably one of the first dives in the Northern Territory. Of course, there are um, a lot of dangers associated with diving in the Northern Territory, and um, I'm covered in lycra because of the threat of Irukandji uh, jellyfish. And in Alfred Searcy's and Sunter's writings, there's um, the accounts of where the Urukanji wouldn't kill you, but it, it'd make people want to die. And their treatment in those days was just uh, letting someone writhe around on the beach for three days in agony. Um, yeah, so that's why we've got the protective clothing on. Um, we started off um, diving up there. I think this is in Popham Bay. Um, this is a basic rig for searching for trepang in Australia where you've just got a, a dory and two divers or uh, sitting off the back. There can be booms off the back of the dory uh, where you can use up to four divers. Our first few dives, we came across a, a croc quickly and learned to be a bit more wary. Some crews um, use up to four divers on tow. This lowers the odds when you, when you cannot see anything else. You're still bumping into your fellow diver for company and it gives you a sort of comfort that someone else is crazy enough to do this. It's very low visibility diving. You can't see a lot. Uh, and you just know that there's big tiger sharks and uh, crocodiles in the, in the environment there. So a bit exciting. So... This is uh, Dr. Mike Gardner of Flinders Uni, and we're uh, taking the genetic samples there. This is Nathan with a knife, and he looks like you should trust him with a knife. <laughs> so we would take uh, 50 samples from each uh, dive site and get the uh, genetic samples from each of those um, uh, individuals, and so we would actually map the diversity of the stock. Um, this is the Coburg Peninsula, uh, where uh, most of the Trepang fishery was based. That's the that's Trepang Bay, Popham Bay, um, Port Essington, and I think that's Raffles. Uh, it's been a while. Check that, and then down. To, Past there, we've got the um, uh, Bowen Strait. This picture from Port Essington. 
and this is Nathan with some crocodile protection, looking very much um, menacing there. Um, and here, this is in the back of uh, Port Essington, you can see there's juvenile recruitment and um, adults. Again, you can see the turbid water. Um, this, I think this is at the Victoria Point settlement, or, or it could be at Smith Point, I'm not sure. But yeah, there's some uh, examples of the Trepang uh, cooking pots in the Cassins. Beautiful sunset, the grey swan. This is from Malay Bay, where we did a lot of tidal flat walking for sandfish. Beautiful location. You can just imagine uh, as a a really safe, secured uh, camp for the Macassans. And this is sort of typically how you come across them. These are juveniles still, um, you know, it's from a, a recent recruitment. See the colour morphs of the sandfish, Holothura scarborough. Um, this is uh, my mate uh, Bunug. Um, from Warrawi, South Golden Island. When we first met him, he was saying, you know, today is not my day. Today is not my day. I can't talk to you. I had no idea what he was getting at until he came out with uh, Geelong is playing in the finals. I have to go watch the game. It was the start of a good friendship with Will Bowman, a fellow Cats fan. But uh, it was nice to be welcomed by the local communities and... Um, you know, uh, they understood what we were doing. They were used to the fishery. They, they, they knew about it. And, um, yeah, we were there to try and include them. And um, uh, I think we've done well with that. So a tamarind tree. So tamarinds were planted by the Macassans um, along the Northern Territory coast. They're not endemic to the area, but uh, that's to um, stop scurvy. Uh, from the old um, uh, Macassan uh, seamen. And uh, yeah, it still bears fruit today, and um, the local kids still eat the fruit. Um, now, these rings, uh, this one's at uh, Warrawi, um, and there's a lot of uh, discussion about what they are and uh, are they a fish trap or are they um, something to do with the trapang industry? Um, my belief is that they would be a live holding uh, place. So um, the local, there was definitely interactions between the local uh, indigenous communities and the Macassans and there would have been um, some sort of live holding um, scenario going on where you know, they could pick up some trepang and put them there and they'd stay good until the buyers would come to return. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. And we found some on uh, Bentic Island as well um, with different construction. And we found another one on Albini Island, which had never been recorded. Um, so I'll, my personal opinion is that they were something to do with holding... Uh, trepang stock um, waiting for the buyers to return. Uh, this is just a, one of our good catches. We we're allowed to catch a little bit more on this trip so we could cover the costs um, as an incentive. Uh, we didn't really get that much. I think we ended up with 1.2 ton. This is the track of our um, journey the way out there, down to Crumber in the Gulf and back. Yep. This is Poboso Island, uh, named for Matthew Flinders' companion, Poboso, who was uh, a Malay and he could interpret with the Macassans. Coming through the English Company Road, and Cape Wilberforce, uh, really in Flinders Wake, you know, we really, you know, it was just having all the history behind us, reading 
about it for years and then coming around here was really an amazing experience. We went spearfishing on out there with like two metre of ears and these blue bone tusk fish were coming through and we're trying to spear them quickly before they zoom off again. Uh, it was pretty uh, gutsy, you know, the amount of sharks up there is phenomenal. Um, here we are with the Keidel uh, guys and some Lardel fellas. Um, this is down on Bentic Island and Andrew's son Matty um, and Watson, they uh, found a turtle, there was a big commotion going on and um, sure enough the turtle became dinner. And um, yeah, traditional tucker for the locals there, they, and they ate everything. Um, you know, it was really interesting seeing the everything to the intestines uh, was used in a curry, and uh, we they were given they gave us the liver, and um, our friend uh, made it, who's Italian, uh, Andrea. Andrea, he uh, put this amazing um, turtle liver risotto, which I don't think has ever been done before. <laughs> I'm not sure, since the Roman days. But uh, definitely, it, we weren't in Kansas anymore. This is part of Australia that most people don't get to see. And, uh, and it was a beautiful part. O oddly enough, the name Australia was uh, proposed by Matthew Flinders in the background there, because that's in Vestavetta Strait, uh, where Matthew Flinders' vessel was moored up when he was actually thinking about what to name Australia. And um, yeah, interesting history and wonderful people. Um, yeah, peace out to all the Mornington Island crew. Uh, this is on Groot Island, and um, got Archie and Judas there in the foreground, Will Bowman. And um, we're doing a training day of how to process the, the sea cucumbers. And yeah, you know, the locals, their forefathers definitely were a part of the um, the industry, and you know they really um, you know were engaged. They were really engaged, you know, to to learn about it um, because you know uh, we took the time to actually teach them because they were going to become part of the industry and. And uh, hopefully that's still flourishing. Um, really look forward to seeing. I know there's a lot of angst about the Blue Mud Bay decision, but like um, I think uh, you know goodwill and um, working together and, and things like this, where Tasmanian seafoods were out there working with communities. I think people have got to recognise that, and if um, that it will become a strong partnership with the. Um, coastal communities going forward, I'm sure. Just bagging up after cooking. Just learning how to make the slit just right in the, uh, the trepang so it doesn't diminish in value in the Chinese markets. Uh, this is me teaching the crew of divers about the Chainman underwater survey uh, method. Um, so we can get uh, good stock numbers and, and measure stocking density and um, growth. Archie also got the same training. Um, this is on Grid Island at Umbacumba. And these are some of the growth trials for the sea ranching experiments. This is a croc cage and it's got a dog for bait. There's one of the camp dogs. There's always uh, an abundance of dogs in some of the camps. And um, yeah, sometimes uh, yeah, cro crocs like dogs. Like crocodiles are dog protection. And two weeks after we got back from our trip, uh, we, as we were diving on the way back, um, you know, we were uh, covering a lot of ground, uh, looking for uh, sea cucumber, but this one, um, this attack happened in an area we were going to go into, and uh, the poor fellow, he, he jumped in to dive for Trepang, and uh, a croc had taken him by the head, 
and swam off with him and uh, the uh, crew had pulled up the hose with the uh, croc still attached to the guy's head and um, my mate Rupert and the skipper, uh, I think it was Jason Grimes, they attacked the croc with a screwdriver and the screwdriver, uh, the croc let go and they, it grabbed him again, they attacked it again, they got the guy on board, he had a big flap of skin off the back of his head and punch marks across his forehead and he survived, um, which was pretty amazing. So. That was our trip, uh, a lot more went on. Um, it was a six week uh, undertaking and this, the study's been published now um, demonstrating the genetic diversity of the sea cucumber population in the Northern Territory, which paves the way for this industry to be revived up to um, its former historic levels. Anyway, Thanks very much for listening. I'm Grant Lee and I'll catch you later.